Thank you, Mary. Good morning, everyone. A little more enthusiasm, come on. Good morning, everyone. So our panel is patients and clinicians on the front line of telehealth. I think it's an exciting opportunity for this audience to hear directly from the people that matter most in the delivery of telehealth, and that's patients, but also from the people um, who are obviously key to that delivery, and that's the clinicians. We are fortunate to ha today to have a great panel. The panelists are all associated with integrated delivery systems. Systems, though, which is uh, a slice of life of the applicability of uh, telemedicine. And so we'll, we'll try to draw that out. Our objectives this morning are numerous, but one of them is to give you those real world examples of telehealth from the perspective of both patients and clinicians. We also want to hear very importantly from patients about what works for in, in telehealth for them and why and what may not work. And then finally, we want to understand the amplified benefits of telehealth in integrated delivery systems, especially when they're connected uh, by uh, an integrated electronic medical record. Um, to help me today in discussing these topics, a great panel. First, I'd like to recognize immediately to my left is a Dr. Neil Evans from the uh, Department of, uh, sorry, got to get your, your bio out here. Dr. Neil Evans uh, from uh, the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, uh, the Office of Connected Care for the Veterans Health Administration. He's boarded in both internal medicine and clinical informatics. Within VHA, Dr. Evans is an active clinician. He manages a panel of internal medicine patients in the primary care clinic right here in Washington, D.C. But importantly, the Office of Connected Care uh, manages the VA's expansive telehealth program and the VA's patient portal, My Health Vet, the VA mobile program, and VHA's innovations initiative. And Dr. Evans is key in all of those. He oversees the development and in implementation of enterprise-wide veteran digital health strategies, transforming care delivery across the care continuum, and importantly, geography and facilitating alignment of health information technologies within the VHA. Just as a way of a, a little praise on his academic background, he, he's trained as a chemical engineer. You're a blue hen, right? Isn't that a blue hen, University of Delaware? Um, and uh, attended medical school at Johns Hopkins, where he also did his medical residency. To his less, left is Dr. Dennis Trong. Uh, Dennis has the title of Director of Mobility Technology for the Mid-Atlantic region of Kaiser Permanente. He is an emergency medicine physician boarded, um, and he joined us in 2010. He earned his BA in molecular biology at UC Santa Cruz, and I think you guys are the banana slugs, is that not correct? That is the mascot for UC Santa Cruz. Attended medical school at Michigan State and did his residency at William Beaumont in Detroit. He's also a proud U.S. Air Force veteran. And uh, one important thing about him that I want you to remember for later on in this conversation is not only is he board certified in emergency medicine, I need the glasses for this, but he is licensed in Virginia, Washington, D.C., Maryland, Florida, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, North Cal Car Carolina, and California. And that multiple state licensure issue is come to life in uh, Dennis's own uh, credentials because he heads our um, House Calls Urgent Care Telemedicine Program. And hopefully we'll talk a little bit more about one of the barriers. It's been alluded to this morning about uh, state licensure requirements for telemedicine. Finally, to his left, we have Miss Brenda Truehart, one of our esteemed Kaiser Permanente members who will give you the skinny on being a patient in the system and using the telemedicine um, uh, faculties and uh, capabilities that we have, what works and what doesn't work. Dennis will introduce her more fully later. Now, um, just by way of a little bit of a summary uh, overview first about telemedicine, and we want to make sure we're all grounded in the basic modalities of telemedicine. Often it's thought of as video medicine, and personally, yeah, I think I understand that, but I want to make sure that people understand that telemedicine has other aspects, and we, at least in Kaiser Permanente, and I'm pretty sure in the VA, try to exploit all of those modalities. They each have their own unique niche, and you're going to see some of that today. First of all, there are pre-scheduled telephone appointments, real interactive 
evaluative appointments that occur by telephone. That's telehealth. There is remote monitoring, usually with an interactive or bi-directional information exchange component. That's telehealth. We would go so far as to say that secure texting between clinicians is a form of telehealth. And, and speaking of um, uh, sort of efficiency factors that were alluded to this morning, we feel that inter uh, clinician secure texting is one of the most um, effective increasers of our physicians' efficiency and is one of the most popular things that we've introduced in the world of telehealth in Kaiser Permanente. We also believe in secure email in a structured format with interactive interrogatories that too can supplant a face-to-face -face visit. Not all secure emails can do that, but some can. And then finally, there's video-based or I would say imaging-based telemedicine. Usually we think of that as video, synchronous, interactive, but it's also been alluded to this morning there is store and forward asynchronous telemedicine. Very, very important in fields like dermatology where there is a, a dearth of specialists who want to practice medical dermatology. There's plenty that want to practice cosmetic dermatology, but real medical or surgical dermatology, there's uh, fewer of those specialists, and something like asynchronous store and fo forward uh, dermatology is very, very useful in expanding and maintaining and distributing access. Uh, with that kind of overview, mini pricey of the modalities of telemedicine, I would like to turn it over with just one minute to spare to our first uh, panelist, Dr. Neil Evans. Thank you, Bernadette. Um, the, uh, and thank you very much. I'm happy to be here and to share a little bit about telemedicine, telehealth, or what we call connected care within the Veterans Health Administration. Um, and I did not expect to be on a panel with another person with a the banana slugs. Who knew the banana slugs? The banana slugs and the blue hens, two mascots that start with the letter B. Anyway, here we go. Let's talk about the veterans. Um, health administration. Um, we are a large integrated healthcare system, and I, um, I think we've heard some discussion over the course of this morning about um, how, we, how we have seen um, a significant um, implementation of telehealth in some of our country's larger integrated healthcare systems, two of which are represented here on the stage today. We take care of nine million, uh, six million plus veterans a year, and we um, do so. We have uh, uh, 326,000 employees, 177,000 which are clinical employees, and we do so at over 1,200 sites of care, physical sites of care. But we have a unique challenge in the VA. Uh, we are the only healthcare system that I know of that has, a, um, well, that we are a healthcare system. There are others within the government healthcare uh, space, but um, where we are. Um, required to deliver health care to eligible veterans, regardless of where they are in the country, even in places where we don't have a physical presence. And that has been one of the big drivers of um, our early adoption of telehealth. Um, but first, uh, some of the speakers this morning gave disclaimers, including Helen, who gave a disclaimer that her one experience in telehealth was answering text messages from relatives about health issues. And, um, I, I actually think that is relevant um, because I think it, it talks about the expectations that consumers are going to have as we move forward into the future um, for the convenience factor of accessing healthcare. We've heard about the, the theme of both access and convenience today. So I wanted to provide a little bit of an example of what this actually looks like. Um, this is my son. He's now 11. This was two years ago. He was nine years old at the time. <clears throat> He's a little bit embarrassed that I uh, continue to use this slide with his spelling mistake and um, improper use of the plural for the word tooth. Um, one of my tooths really hurts. Um, this was me, I believe, at the time I was at a conference and about to present, so I could have been doing this right here a minute ago. Um, I had taken him to the dentist earlier that day. His mom was home with him. I don't know why he chose to text me. Uh, instead of my wife um, when she was just downstairs. But nevertheless, um, what I love about this is that this shows asynchronous telehealth, um, and it happens spontaneously in a nine-year-old, um, that he sent me the image to help me understand exactly 
what he was talking about, right? And this is closed loop telehealth, right? So I, you know, went over and texted my wife who was downstairs and said, Henry's tooth hurts. Maybe we should give him some medication. Um, he was reminding me. I got a little reminder that it really hurts. And then I got follow-up that this encounter had been completed, that mom got him the acetaminophen. All was well. This is the customer. These are the consumers of our future health care system. And we need to be prepared to serve these customers. Um, but... In the VA, um, and I think oftentimes the population that benefits the most from telehealth and where there probably is a stronger business case, since we've been talking about the finances behind this, is in the elderly population. And we certainly have, with complex chronic illness and multiple needs and multiple needs to interact with the healthcare system. And we certainly have that situation within the VA. You can see here the number of living veteran, uh, veterans per age group. And if you look in 2017, um, our population is heavily shifted towards the po a population that is 65 years and older. So. When we think about telemedicine in VA, we think about telemedicine, um, this is our mission statement. We think about it from, and these two themes have come up already several times this morning. It's about access, and it's about, the, in our case, the veteran's experience. You could translate veteran's experience, perhaps, into convenience, if you wish, since we have heard that theme today. Um, but it's not just, it's about how do we leverage technologies to provide access to care and improve the veteran's experience, but to do so in a way that makes sense and is effectively integrated into the daily lives of both veterans and our clinical teams. Um, we think about things in three categories. How do we use technology to connect patients with the providers that are part of their care teams? How do we um, leverage what we offer in healthcare, which is access to trusted relationships to improve health? How do we connect patients to their health information and allow them to share health information with us to better have an exchange? And how do we improve the care experience? We do this, our technology set, as Bernadette mentioned, includes our portal, mobile applications, connected devices, Internet of Things. I don't think the technology matters all that much. What matters is how, we, how this improves care delivery. Where did we start in VA? I think this surprises everyone. Our first telehealth encounter, I could take a show of hands as to when you think that might have happened, but I'm looking at the clock. So I'm going to tell you that it was in 1959. In 1959, um, we did our first telemedicine visit. It was a group therapy, telemental health, by two-way television between the University of Nebraska and um, the Omaha, Lincoln, and Grand Island VA hospitals. Um, now, there was a pretty large gap between 1959 and a broader implementation of telehealth. But where are we today? Um, it was mentioned earlier by Helen that we um, last year did more than 2.1 million episodes of telehealth care. And um, there's a definition issue here. We define telehealth a little bit differently um, than Kaiser in these numbers that we report, um, although I'm advocating to adopt the way you measure uh, telehealth, to include, for example, tele scheduled telephone visits and secure email encounters. These visits are either a full month of remote home monitoring, a video visit, or a store and forward telehealth encounter where some image is sent back and forth and an interpretation occurs. That's the, what the 2.1 million visits are. And 12% of our veterans received at least a portion of their care through one of those modalities last year. Um, and approximately 45% of them lived in highly rural areas. Um, <clears throat> the, um, if you add in telephone care, that number increases significantly. And so I want to spend just one minute um, going through this slide here, which sort of gives you the landscape of how we think about telehealth and implement it in the VA. It's a pretty broad implementation of telehealth. And I, we, uh, Bernadette mentioned the modalities. That's an important way we think about it. What are the technologies we use? And we also think about this um, in two other frameworks. One, where does telehealth occur? Um, and we think about this in three locations. I think you've heard this earlier today. In the home, how are we delivering care into the home? And we are doing that through our, our portal, through secure email, through scheduled telephone visits, uh, through um, mobile apps that are allowing veterans to share their data back with their healthcare team, 
through remote home monitoring through our home telehealth program, uh, where we last year, for example, monitored 147,000 patients over the course of the year in their home and saw a 31% reduction in admissions and a 57% reduction in bed days of care. We deliver clinic, uh, telehealth in the clinic environment, connecting our remote clinics, often in rural areas where there isn't a, a distribution of specialists, to our main medical centers. Um, and we also do store and forward telehealth there. Um, and in uh, the hospital, tele-ICU and tele-stroke you heard mentioned. We also think about this as how we implement it. We implement it re locally. This is about access. We implement telehealth regionally. We have multiple telehealth hubs across the country, um, which is all about building capacity or efficiency. And we implement it at the national level, thinking about matching patients with the unique clinician who can help deliver the care that they need, um, increasing quality across the healthcare system. Um, th this is a high priority for our organization. Um, many of you may have seen us announce our Anywhere to Anywhere Healthcare Initiative, and during the questions, I'd be happy to talk a little bit more about what that is. Um, and that was also announcing our video solution, which we can also talk about, and you'll see demonstrated in a video in a little bit. So with that, I am um, going to hand things over to Dennis, who is going to share a little bit about the Kaiser experience. Good. All right, I'm Dennis Trong. I'm um, the Telemedicine Mobility Director for uh, Kaiser Permanente and Mid Atlantic Permanente Medical Group here in the uh, DC area. Um, first of all, I have a disclaimer. Um, I actually grew up with a huge fan crush on Kaiser Permanente. Right? I grew up in that way in the sense that I grew up in Northern California, um, where one of every two members or uh, population are members. Um, I grew up thinking that healthcare was like this everywhere. Right? So when I started my uh, medical school and residency, I was in Detroit, and quickly I figured out healthcare not like this everywhere. Right. So after that, going, I joined into the uh, Air Force, and I was a medical doctor in the Air Force. And once again, think life was a little normal again because it was more standardized. It was a camaraderie, and that's where we first started using uh, telehealth. Well, I, my first experience with telehealth was using WebEx um, as a night doctor in order to speak to my colleagues in the States who are surgeons to get some uh, consultation. And that's my first experience with telehealth. And then after that, I actually worked for the VA for a little bit. And I was a fork in the road where I was enamored with the VA system also. It was a great system. And I was at this fork in the road. You joined uh, Kaiser, you joined the VA. Um, I think either way, my choice has been amazing. Um, I, I followed Dr. Loftus here over to, <laughs> over to Mid-Atlantic. Because um, interestingly, small fact is that I grew up about a mile away from uh, one of the most darling medical centers of Northern California Kaiser, Santa Clara. So that heavily influenced my uh, decision to come here. And um, I'm actually just very honored to be in front of you today talking about this. Now, what is the sweet sauce? What is the secret sauce that we have at Kaiser Permanente? It's not about the telehealth, not about the technology. It's about the foundation of our system, right? We value integration, and everything that we do here, all this whole web is about the integration of our system. It's not the horizontal integration. It's the vertical integration. I think of it like a, like a DNA helix, right? It's like this DNA helix. At the center, the spine, is a patient. And everything we do revolves around that patient. So whether it's technology, whether it's a new department, uh, whether it's a new workflow, it really evolves around how do, we get, how do we deliver patient care better, right? It's like this relentless pursuit of bettering care. And that's what the culture at Kaiser Permanente that I've learned um, and still carry out to this day. Now, with knowing all the pieces of your Legos, that's how we start thinking about telehealth, which I think, hey, how do I improve the system? We have this innovation um, opportunities throughout Kaiser. Throughout our eight regions, we have 21,000 physicians and countless other nurses. Right? They all have an opportunity to give input into innovation, including telehealth. Um, with their input, there's a due diligence that happens. Right? You, it's like you're sifting for gold. You're, you're filtering. You're, you're, you're trying to sift through it and you figure out you know, what are the good pieces that actually fit into our, our organization. Not the shimmery, not the shiny, but what fits into bettering patient care. Within all that, like in Mid-Atlantic, we have the opportunity to do that. You know when you're sitting at your desk and you have a great idea, you got an aha moment? And what I used to do is write on a little sticky note. And you put it on your monitor, right? Um, and then those sticky notes are accumulating and it forms a nice little flower around your monitor, right? Um, here in Mid-Atlantic, what we have is we have a little light bulb. 
right in Health Connect in your EMR system. So when you're sitting there, you go, I have an aha idea. You click that light bulb right away, just put your idea in there. And it submits directly to someone from one of our teams. And then we evaluate do due diligence from there. So that way the idea didn't get lost. And then we bring that physician or that nurse or whoever submitted the idea back into being the champion of the idea. Because obviously there's some passion. Something drove them to submit that idea. So in telehealth, there are many ideas around telehealth right now in our organization that that's how it, it occurred. And luckily for us, we have, being an integrated care delivery system across the country, our eight regions coordinate and share best practices and meet and have committees in order to take these ideas and make sure that we're doing what's best for the whole system, not just one individual region. And that's what really, that's one thing I really love about uh, the opportunity of Kaiser Permanente is be able to um, share best practice with colleagues and learn from them from the other regions. It really makes your learning curve much easier. And one of the ideas that we had was video visits, and I'm going to go ahead and talk about that in a little bit. I know Neil's going to talk about remote monitoring. I'll just talk about video visits uh, in a second here. But first, before you, you move forward, you got to look at your history. And you look at the trends and what is in your system already, where are you moving toward? Kaiser Permanente has been doing telehealth for about more than 20 years now, in the sense that we started out as thinking as we need patients to have a portal to be able to access the medical records. An idea that wasn't very cool at the time, but it's very cool now. Right? They thought about this well before it, um, it became a cool factor. And then after that, we were like, well, what if patients can refill their prescriptions online? What if they can share, check their lab results online? What if they can email their doctor directly? You know, my dad's a Kaiser member. He loves the emailing part. <laughs> yeah, but then other than that, what if the patients in 2012, what if the patients have a smartphone in their pocket that they can do everything from their phone? Right? All these ideas continue to progress, and then in 2014, that's when we, we were like, well, what if a patient can see a doctor by video, and that doctor have all the electronic medical records in front of them? So Dr. Loft has talked a little bit about some of the uh, dimensions of telehealth. I was going to mention briefly what we do here at uh, Kaiser Permanente. Uh, we talked about storing forward. That's like PAC system, uh, teleradiology. We do teledermatology here. Uh, we talked about M Health, the patient portal. Our physicians also have um, Haiku, which they can check patient medical records and take some action from their phones. Uh, over 50% of our physicians in Kaiser Permanente and um, all the medical groups have a, a KP issued iPhone. Um, we talk about remote patient monitoring. Uh, we have the ability to uh, monitor patients with uh, remote glucometers, uh, re remote CHF monitoring, uh, blood pressure monitoring. Uh, that's some of the other projects we have here. But let's talk about video. So with video, it's about two-way interaction between a person, a caregiver, um, patient or provider, and then the provider by using audio-visual communication. Uh, this is live, not asynchronous, like we talked about with store and forward. Uh, a couple of ways we do this within uh, Kaiser Permanente is with urgent care, primary care, mental health. Uh, a patient can basically go on their portal or go into their handy-dandy app and book an appointment directly. Right? They can also call the call center, and the call center calls to book it directly. As far as chronic disease management, our patients can be followed up by their primary care physician or their specialist for follow-up appointments by video, um, basically saving the patient time and money when they don't have to really come into the clinic every single time. Um, other innovation we've had here at facility to facility, our piece of specialists um, here in the Mid-Atlantic, especially, um, if you bring your child into your pediatrician and there's some diagnosis, maybe they think they have a pediatric neurological disorder. And as a parent, you'd be concerned. And if you're in the outside world, outside of an integrated system, it might take two months to get a, a, uh, a specialist appointment for a pediatric neurologist. What we're able to do is using telehealth, using site-to-site -site, uh, technology with video, we're able to get you an appointment same day, usually the same hour, to the pizza specialist that's in a remote location. Just to get things started, and actually as a parent, that really you know, kind of calms you down knowing that you know, we have a plan in place right now from a diagnosis. Uh, we also, some parts of Kaiser Permanente, we have telestroke, where um, a member may show up to an ER with stroke-like symptoms. Um, and I'm an ER physician, and it's good to know that a neurologist can be on a video with me, kind of my wingman, just to try to help me out, wing woman, help me out when, um, when in that moment where it's a little stressful. You're, this person may be having a stroke. You want to make sure that you're not going to get that TPA in the wrong cases. So this is a great innovation that we've had here at Kaiser Permanente. So we talked about these sticky note idea. Um, I just want to walk through our sticky note idea when we first started thinking about video visits was we think about more what ifs. You always got to think about the what if. You know, what if you had a patient who was sick at home and um, you know, 
they, they just they didn't, they didn't need to come in or they didn't want to come in. And then they did, went to a handy dandy app, what they call the call center, and then that patient can get an appointment for a video visit. And here at Kaiser Permanente, there's no copay. So when they get this video visit, they have a technological support. And what if that technological support can just call, give them a call, courtesy call, and say, hey, you know, are, you, are you able to get on okay? Just make sure there's that red, uh, kind of like that warm handoff to get on. And then what if that patient came on and they see it's a permanente physician, a physician that knows the medical record, and is able to access a record and it's actionable data. They're able to prescribe, um, order labs, order radiology, um, use proactive care. If a patient comes on with me and they're due for their, their mammogram, I can order the mammogram right from a video visit, right? And that prescribe medicine to any of the Kaiser Permanente facilities or outside. And then follow up, they can always email us back if they're not getting better. A closed loop of care. And then that idea is what kind of spurred where we are today with video visit part of, uh, of our telemedicine at, at Kaiser Permanente. So without further ado, I would like to speak Ms. Ms. Trueheart about her experience with video visits here at Kaiser Permanente. You okay? Yes. Hello, my name is Brenda Trueheart. I'm a Washingtonian. Um, I was with KP, Kaiser Permanente, uh, in the 90s when my kids were young. And they were, I thought it was great because I'd been, I'd had the others, you know, Aetna, Blue Cross Blue Shield. And when I got to Kaiser, it was all in one swoop, you know, fell swoop. You know, with boys, you go in often, they're bleeding here or there. I just go and get taken care of. So I left Perman, uh, KP when I changed employers, and then I came back in 2000. And it's a different, it's very much different now. It is all inclusive, it's very easy. It's, um, it's life changing really, because I'm not one that has a, a lot of medical problems, but when I do have them, it's very easy and it's, uh, everything I need is right, right there in one place. Great, thanks for that. Can you, um, can you tell us how, how have you used um, technology or telehealth um, within your experience at Kaiser Permanente Square? Um, telehealth, well, I've used emails to secure emails. I've made appointments online. I've talked to my physicians on the phone. Um, I've used the portal. I order my medicine uh, through, through use of the portal or the KP Medicine app. If they have their own. Um, I also used remote monitoring. The remote monitoring, I have a device, and every month I have a, um, an appointment that's set up, which I don't have to use because the doctor, I can talk to him during that time if I choose, but most of the time I have no need because he monitors not only my use of the device and how I'm doing, but he also monitors my device to make sure it's in in working order. And so that is very convenient because I never have to go in. Um, I've used a 24-hour call center <laughs> to set up, and this is where I met Dr. Tron about three weeks ago. Awesome. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself as far as, you know, um, I know you're a busy professional woman, and um, we, you know, using, why do you use the modalities rather than go in and see a physician? Well, actually, I really don't going to the doctor is not a favorite thing for me since I, I think my kids got me out of that. <laughs> but um, it saves time. It saves trans. I don't have to go anywhere. I can do it anyway. As long as I have a phone or a computer, I can, I take full advantage of it. It's time saving. Um, I talk to a doctor that knows me. My records are there when I talk to them in any way. Any way that I contact them, my records are there. Um, it's a KP doctor. Um, it saves money. I don't, there's no copay. Um, if I were to go someplace else, say if I would just went to a regular urgent care, I'd have to pay them. And then I would have to go, if I wasn't with KP, then I would probably more than likely have to go to another doctor afterwards. So it's um, all the way around. It's time saving, it makes life easy. Um, would you mind sharing your experience on, on you know, when, when you had that, that condition and you, uh, and you went to the, the usual, you know, 
you called the call center, do those things, and then how we met. Can you go through the whole experience, how it was from your end? I sure will. It was three Saturdays ago. Well, on Friday, I'd hurt, I had hurt my wrist. Went to bed. You know, I, it wasn't a big deal. But at night, a lot of times, things get worse. So when I woke up, I woke about 7 o'clock, and it was really stiff. It was hurting. I said, oh, I better go have this looked at. So I called the 24-hour uh, call center. And I asked the um, lady, I said, um, which, yeah, I wanted to know which center closest to me was open, nearer, nearest to me was open. And so um, I made an appointment. It wasn't far. It was right down in Manassas. And I made an appointment. I think I had scheduled it. She gave me a choice of times to go in. So I think I said 2 o'clock. So the morning went on, and my, of course, the risk got better. It's like, I don't need to go. I don't need to go to the doctor. I'll go and I'll cancel. So when I called her, she, I told her that my wrist felt better and I wanted to cancel. So she said, hmm. She said, how about a video conference? And I had never done that. I said, a video conference? And she told me, she said, it's very easy. You, you know, you either go on your app or your computer. Um, I'll send you a detailed email on how to check your computer to make sure you have everything. Um, and then you just sign on early. And then I'll have the doctor call you. And um, he'll call you, and you'll have it. I said, that sounds great. I chose a time. And I think that one was noon, 1 o'clock or so. And so I got an email, and it said, sign on now. So I signed on. I had signed on previously just to make sure I could get on and everything was working correctly on my, on my computer because I didn't use my phone because I needed the use of my hand. I'm sure he wanted to see that. So when he came on, he came on. Dr. Chong came on early, um, and I was logged on. And it was great because it was face-to-face. -face. It was at, you know, he has a great bedside manner. <laughs> and so, and I mean, I, he told me to, you know, he completely, you know, he examined my hand. The same thing that he would do in the office, if I had gone to see him, he did, and he was very, he could tell. And he diagnosed it as a bad sprain. It was just a sprain, and he directed me what to do. Um, he told me he was up, updating my records, my medical record, and uh, that was it. And if I had any problems, so please just, you know, be sure to call him or email him. It didn't matter. So it was great. It was great. So I am a fan. I'm a fan. Uh, do you remember during the exam? I mean, for some folks in the room, you might be, well, how can you do an exam over a video? What, what, what was the sign that we did? Was it? Oh, <laughs> he said, just do like do, this. Do, do the bye-bye sign. Do the bye-bye sign. <laughs> she, did, she did move her wrist all around. It was, it all was, around. It was you great. You could see everything. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So, with your experience, um, what you know, I'm, you're kind of in the IT industry too. You I understand you do a lot of uh, program management work in, in the technology industry. What um, what kind of advice can you give give us as far as what would you improve on, or um, what did you really like about the the, the whole experience mm -hmm. about getting on to, for a video visit? Oh, it was very easy to get on. They even have a. Um app on site that will check my computer for me to make sure everything's there that that's needed for the conference. Um, very easy. Anyone can walk through it, but just in case you haven't, that's why you get on early. And um, a technician was going to call, but I told her, you know, that's okay. You know, I'm sure it would be fine. Um, as improvements, maybe a way to maybe upload documentation that may be necessary or you would feel necessary or I would feel necessary. We can do that. I'll show you how to do that after. Oh, you can do that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, okay. So, I mean, I think Ms. True, I brought up a lot of good points about um, many things that our speaker spoke about today about, you know, it's really about, um, about the, for integration, especially for me and uh, for our system and Neil and, uh, and uh, Dr. Loftus here, our system are, it's, it's integrated and that's a, it's important because telehealth becomes a complement of your system. It becomes it extends your reach, uh, and extends patients' reach to you also. Um, and also, it's you know she was talking about how the technical assistance and not just make the technology and you know just go run with it. You know, our 
our population still needs a little handhold at the beginning, uh, just like any talking technology. It's like riding a bike. Once you get used to it, it's really easy, right? I mean, very easy. Yeah. Um, I'd like to open the floor for questions, or, or Dr. Is this for uh, Neil first and question after? I'm just going to briefly introduce this. Uh, this um, first of all, Ms. Truhart, thank you so much for coming. I I think meetings are always better always better when we have the patient's voice as uh, part of the discussion. And so it's really uh, great that you spent the time to come. <laughs> and I was going to bring a patient as well, and I went down my list, and um, we were, I was aiming to bring a patient who is on our home telehealth program. We target high-risk, um, highly complex patients. And as I started to work down my list of people that are on the remote monitoring program, one is in dialysis at the moment, the other... Um, um, is w would be a major transportation problem getting here, et cetera. And so instead of bringing a patient, um, um, since the panel is about patients and clinicians on the front line of telehealth, we're going to show a little video um, that, that shows a little just taste of what telehealth and what um, connected care, virtual care, can look like um, in a healthcare system. So you can just get a picture of it um, to help support the discussions that we're having today during this great meeting. Um, and, and there's a couple, actually, I think, interesting themes that um, in the video that come, uh, um, that, that key off of some of what we've been talking about. Um, one is about training. How do we actually help support patients in using technology? You're going to see that. One is about, is there value sometimes found in virtual visits that, that may not be as easy to, to tease out in a face-to-face -face visit? And then the third is, a, is about innovations um, and how in an integrated healthcare system, when there's a commitment to virtual care, you can start to get some really interesting ideas coming to the forefront. So let's go ahead with the video. I got hit twice in the head and in the legs and stuff. I was relatively normal just with epilepsy and then I started having too many seizures and they cut out a section of my brain and I used to be an electrical engineer and now I'm not. But in his next chapter, Navy veteran Emerson Beach has become an important volunteer in Charleston, South Carolina. Among his key duties, assisting fellow veterans as they sign up for My Healthy Vet. The platform empowers veterans to become active participants in their own health care, from refilling prescriptions online to securely messaging providers. My Healthy Vet is one of several offerings provided by VA's Office of Connected Care, along with VA telehealth services, the VHA Innovation Program, and VA Mobile. All are working to extend access to care beyond the traditional office visit. I'd like to say that the VA has saved my life. I would not be alive for sure um, if it were not for the VA. I think that My Healthy Vet had a tremendously large part of that because joining in My Healthy Vet got me to realize that I can be successful. He got on board, he registered for an account, we got him authenticated, and then he was able to use all the features so then he could talk on his experience using it um, to fellow veterans so they can really see how it does work and how it can help. What I use all the time is my prescription refills. You also have the ability to look at the results of tests and the secure messaging feature is incredibly easy to use. It's a point and click. It's just like sending an email to another user. It took me a while, but I realized that I'm providing added value to veterans, and that gives me a positive feeling inside more than just being an engineer did. VA Telehealth Services continues to offer valuable solutions as well. And with the work of mental health providers like Dr. Kim Gilroy and Judy Morris, VA is now able to provide telehealth care to veterans from the comfort and convenience of their own homes. When I think about the future of telehealth in the VA, it reminds me of one of my first experiences in the VA when someone said, you know, we don't just try to find answers, we try to find solutions. I think that telehealth has that potential to be a solution. If I'm going to have a session, I turn on my computer and I wait for the veteran to call me and I click the green button, I accept and there he is. 
I see it being beneficial for a few reasons. There are veterans that live in outlying areas that can't get in. A patient having a surgical or a dermatological issue needing to see a specialist at Mather can come into where I work at McClellan, see me that day, I can photograph their dermatology issue, get it uploaded to our secure server and have a doctor look at it within a few days. One of the differences is that I can access them in their daily life. So if I'm talking with a veteran about how he feels about Memorial Day and he lights up a cigarette, I'll pause for a minute and I'll ask him, what just happened for you right there? And so I kind of see them in these really subtle, nonverbal ways. One of my veterans actually had said to me, your therapy has been the most effective for me. And what he attributed it to really is that he's not as anxious. He is at his best when he was at home. VHA's innovation program continues to work on the cutting edge of that technology. Platforms like Revamp were constructed, incubated, and tested in innovation's safe harbor environment with the intent of rolling out for veterans' use around the country. Revamp is a new web-based care pathway that we're working on to allow improved access to care for veterans for their sleep apnea management and diagnosis. We are really excited about Revamp because this is the first web-based platform that really takes patient information, validated standardized information, and PAP adherence in one single place. It enables them to get diagnostic sleep testing and to have ongoing long-term management of their sleep apnea in the comfort of their own home. I think there's also a trend towards patients wanting to feel more empowered and be more engaged in self-management. So while Revamp isn't a wearable technology like a Fitbit is, um, it still allows them to engage in looking at their own data that's generated by their PAP machine. It allows them to watch videos about the diagnostic testing equipment, understand how the process works, and Revamp does offer a secure messaging feature. So Revamp is very exciting from a veteran perspective. It offers them a number of new opportunities to engage in their healthcare. The success of Revamp has really depended on the concept of teamwork from partnering with other physicians, innovators at other sites, all the way to working with the information security officer and privacy officer. We've been very fortunate to have had an outstanding team that has worked so well together. Together, these technologies are expanding access and care to veterans across the country. And by integrating these technologies, VA continues to find new ways to connect veterans, their caregivers, and their care teams, ensuring they have access to personalized care when and where they need it. Thank you for sharing that video, uh, Dr. Evans. We have about 15 minutes for questions at this point in time. And while you're organizing your thoughts about what you'd like to query our panel, but I want to point out one thing that I don't believe has been um, addressed this morning in relation to telehealth. And that's um, our point of view that it also is a, an amazing population health tool in the sense that uh, we find that in terms of outreach to our populations, uh, to get care for chronic conditions, to be monitored for chronic conditions, far more responsiveness to texts than to old-fashioned letters and to phone calls. We can, we can measure a two- to four-fold difference in the responsiveness of patients to come in for, to obtain some of the screening that they need when we've texted them versus uh, when we've sent them the, the old-fashioned letter or when we've even made an outreach call. In fact, um, texting far superior to secure messaging for that same um, for that same application. We send a lot of messages out for population health reminders. We see a lot of them never opened, and so we find the most responsive thing that we get is texting. Just wanted to point that out. The other thing I would say is 
uh, probably common to the VA and to um, Kaiser Permanente is when we're in an encounter of any kind, whether that's scheduled telephone or whether it's a synchronous video, one of the things that our providers are always doing because they're connected to that EMR is scanning that record for, hey, what else does this patient need? This patient may have called in for a problem with a sprained wrist, but I notice um, that she also needs a mammogram and I'm gonna re reflect that to her in this visit and order that and get that set up for her. So this connection and the ability to, in every encounter, whether it be face-to-face -face or virtual, to uh, push forward our agenda around population health, I think is a hallmark of integrated delivery systems. And I think one of the main reasons why we innovate a lot around it in our integrated delivery systems. Um, uh, one of the things that I'll do is get us started with some questions, and I would like to um, ask uh, Dennis and uh, Neil to provide us any reflections you may have on the ability of telehealth modalities to at least partially address provider burnout. Someone mentioned that this morning in the first panel. Um, I think it was Helen. Helen said there is no joy in medicine. No, there's very little joy in medicine right now. And is this uh, a modality, a different way of seeing our patients, perhaps maybe a small bit of an answer, or is it just another task we have to accomplish in our days? Um, so we talk about physician burnout. We're talking about that, um, the quadruple aim, right? We talk, everyone knows about the triple aim, um, about improving quality access, lower cost, and then the quadruple aim is, you know, physician, clinician, well-being. Um, I think for us at, at Kaiser Permanente, it's been very helpful in the sense that, you know, we always had this um, this underlying culture that um, our physicians, our providers are trying to provide the right care, right time, right place, right? When you match those up pretty well, then your physicians in the clinic can have more time to deal with more complex patients, more complex cases, right? And we found that our physicians that do, do use telehealth in that manner um, are finding that, you know, they're, the patients that are doing telehealth are very happy because they get more time on the screen. We're, we're kind of cutting out some of the waste. And then the patients that are being seen in clinic that have more complex cases are getting more time, more attention. Um, the physicians are less stressed about trying to get room to room. Right. So that's one way that we found that is helping physician well-being. Um, and then many of our physicians are, you know, our patients carry around smartphones, so do our physicians now. So not much of the technology and much of the delivery is starting to move for us towards smartphones, where our physician can be more mobile in different places. Uh, we do have a, a, a pilot where we do have physicians that are, are able to deliver care from home or from whatever clinic they're at. So you think about that mobile uh, solution for them, it makes them much more efficient. Um, and more flexible, they can control their time better. Um, those are just a couple aspects that we found our physicians that do telehealth are happier, and the patients that use telehealth, they actually have what it was like a 10% higher satisfaction score um, using telehealth than in office visits. You know, that's really good in office visits already, but yeah, I I, I, I think it's um, I, this is a very this is a very important question, and <clears throat> I think it's a mixed bag. Um, um, and a lot of this depends on how telehealth is implemented and the incentives around it. Um, I, I think most providers recognize the value proposition. Most providers want to have a better connection with their patient, want to deliver more responsive care, want to deliver higher quality of care, but they're, they're frustrated with the volume of work. And the danger of telehealth is that it becomes just yet another um, inbox that one has to manage. Um, and so I think there are, are three themes that I like to think about that help with this question. Number one is um, that, that telehealth initiatives are best implemented in a team-based environment. And one has to be really careful to think about who on the team should be doing what action. Um, not all secure messages need to go to the physician. Um, not all, the, you, know, you heard a lot about uh, the technical check before a video visit. That's a way that we can 
um, make this better for the patient. The second is you have to recognize this as value. Kaiser and VA have both made a significant commitment to saying this is something that we do, and we're going to recognize the delivery of care via these virtual means as equivalent to face-to-face -face care. We're going to give you workload credit for it. The, the parallel for that in the private sector is reimbursement, which is why this topic of reimbursement comes up so often. Um, it's how do you um, help me with that? And then the third part of this is any implementation needs to, ha needs to be customized and have the provider team's voice in it. Otherwise, there's not buy-in, and it just leads to more burnout. I think we have some questions from the floor now. I don't know who came up to the mic first. Over here to my left. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Melissa Williams, and I'm with the National Patient Advocate Foundation. Um, first, I just want to thank Kaiser Permanente for convening this um, this forum. I think the topic is just so timely. Um, I just want to start off by saying a little bit what um, National Patient Advocate Foundation does, in case some of you are not familiar with it. But we are, our tagline is the patient voice. And so I'm so glad to see that being reflected in this panel. Um, but we're the advocacy affiliate to the Patient Advocate Foundation, and it's a national nonprofit that provides direct case management services to patients all across the country, so people who need um, assistance dealing with billing errors, um, needing help to get to their appointments, um, insurance snafus, you name it, um, our case managers uh, will be there to assist these people. Um, it seems as if telehealth could really be a great solution to a lot of the issues that they face. Um, for instance, one of the things that um, patients call about is transportation. Um, they can't get to their appointments. Um, they have to take time off work to get to their appointments or they have to rely on a caregiver to take them to their appointments. Um, and I just want to add that a lot of the patients that we serve, um, their income level is, the majority of them is $23,000 and below. Um, and so, you know, telehealth sounds like a really great solution, but there is this digital divide. And so how does, how is the VA and Kaiser Permanente, how do you all deal with that or what are your suggestions so that, you know, these services are accessible to, to everyone? Yeah. The, this is a very important question as well about the digital divide, and <clears throat> I think, um, you know, in our healthcare system in the VA, we t we take care of um, um, because of the eligibility criteria uh, within the VA, our our population is shifted towards lower socioeconomic status. There's an income cutoff um, for vet which veterans are eligible for care within the VA, and so we. Um, we face this challenge um, because of access to technology simply because of, from an affordability perspective or broadband internet, um, but also because of the challenges of accessing uh, broadband internet for these services in rural America. Um, and I, you know, I think this is one of the advantages that an integrated healthcare system brings to the table. If, if we have a patient who we know has a significant chronic condition and is going to benefit from regular virtual care in the home, we provide the equipment um, with cellular services. Um, and there, we, there's a strong business case for us to do that. Um, we, we, we save tremendous money uh, by doing so. Um, many of these patients, we actually pay to pay their travel costs back and forth to the medical center. We save that travel cost. We deliver them more responsive care. Um, and so, so some of it is providing technology. But I would say, I would take a step back earlier. This is also where there's some value in thinking about telehealth doesn't happen magically. Um, and it's not just having the technology, it's knowing how to use it. And so doing training during face-to-face -face care optimizing the time that you have in person with patients, which is about delivering healthcare, but also helping them leverage your digital tools um, is another way that you can reduce that divide. Yeah, I totally agree with Neil. There's a lot of things we've caught kind of a uh, shamelessly stealing is one of the things what we're trying to copy with from the VA is the fact that we, we recognize there are patients that um, will not be able to you know, afford to get into the clinic and also can't afford a digital device to connect by telehealth. So some of the projects we have going on in some of our regions is to send the patient home with uh, a, a KP um, issued device where they can connect to their provider. And most of these are more chronic conditions, just like you're, you guys are doing. So um, yeah, I'm a great admirer of, of your system 
and how you guys went with that. So that's well, we're definitely copying that uh, that strategy too. Over here. Well, thanks for answering that digital divide question. Uh, I did have a quick follow up on that in the general question. The follow up on the digital divide question was: uh, once you send the patient with the technology. Uh, do you then provide services to support that patient with the functioning of that technology as well? Yes, yes. We have a help desk that's all available to them. And um, for some patients, we'll do an in-person visit uh, to help them get set up uh, with the technology in, in the home. So my general question was, um, can non-integrated or even integrated organizations adopt the practices of such successful organizations like yours uh, piecemeal? Or do they really have to start thinking about uh, a more fuller adoption of the way you approach it? I think absolutely the answer is that organizations can adopt um, these um, technologies piecemeal. And again, it's not about the technology. It's identify a problem. This is a clinical problem that we have. This is a problem that our patients are having. It's, a, it's an issue, a point of stress for both patients and our healthcare system. And then think about what solution solves that problem. Um, oftentimes what I think happens is um, healthcare systems, somebody goes to a conference, they see some technology, they say this is kind of ex exciting, and they think about how do I apply this technology to my healthcare system, as opposed to thinking about what is the problem that wh where are the pain points in healthcare delivery, where are we having outcomes that we're not so happy with, and now let's think about sort of a holistic approach that involves both face-to-face -face care and virtual care, that may involve, you know, not, it's not all video care, that may involve monitoring, that may involve, you know, a web-based portal, something simple. It's, uh, I mean, it's funny that we say that that's simple. It didn't used to be simple, but now it's pretty simple, some of these technologies. Um, that, in my mind, is, is the approach and allows you to then bring programs on in a way that makes sense for your organization. Hi, I have a similar question on the technology and where the state of the art is um, for the technology. Uh, given the experience of physicians with EHRs and you know the promise of uh, transforming practice through EHRs and then the, the practical reality for physicians, where is the technology, the state of the technology for virtual visits and for remote patient monitoring? And the reason I have this question is because I look at all of this new technology development, and quite a bit of it has to do with aspects of remote patient monitoring, and people are pouring millions of dollars into these solutions. Are, are there good solutions, satisfactory solutions out there now, or is there a need to continue to improve um, the, the technology available? Well, um, I believe there's, there's always opportunity to improve technology, right? But then I think the big part is integrating it, right? We have so many pieces of technology out there that it causes more fragmentation in the technology world. With not integrated, if you're a, a clinician and you're a patient and you're trying to use five apps and for five different devices, I, like, I think of it like home automation, right? Back in the days when you had one clicker for your shades, one clicker for your, your, your lights, one clicker for what, a TV, whatever it is. Um, now you just you say, Alexa, sleep time, boom, everything goes off, <laughs> right? I kind of think about this should be almost that seamless and everything needs to be integrated if you're going to really get a great experience for the patient and for the clinician. So it's not about shining shimmery in, in my mind. I love going like CES. I love seeing technology. But I think about it, I go, how does that really fit in, into our model and what we're, what we're trying to do, the, the solution we're trying to provide? Right. I mean, I think that sums it up. So we are unfortunately out of time. I did want to especially thank Ms. Brenda Trueheart for sharing her story with us. We know that this was actually a long commute for you this morning, uh, perhaps a little bit daunting, and we really appreciate you being here to be that voice of the patient. Please let us know. Ping him, ping me, if we're falling down on the job now, okay? So you've got to be that voice of the patient as we continue to deploy more technology. To my panelists, Dr. Dennis Trong, Dr. Neil Evans, thank you very, very much for a stimulating, fascinating panel this morning. And to our audience, you're now invited to lunch. It's back where we had breakfast this morning, back in the mission room. Want to bring you back here around 12.50 because we have another video we'd like to share with you this morning. One more round of applause for all of our Thank you.